I think part of the discussion already is based on a false narrative, which is if we don't build all these hundreds of thousands of units of luxury housing, what? Right. Where else do we build all these hundreds of thousands of units of luxury housing? I don't think that's the question. We're being asked to solve a problem I'm not sure entirely exists. There are studies that I think are somewhat specious that show we're as short as three and a half million units in California. I think that includes an assumption that we have to house everyone that wants to come to California. And if there are major businesses that want to come and bring thousands of well-paid employees and they fill up more luxury housing, that that's our responsibility. Well, I don't think we have a responsibility to house the entire population of the United States. <laughs> Especially in Los Angeles, which I think is finding it has more and more limited infrastructure. If we bring everyone that wants to come here, we wind up with 700 million people. We'll probably still have the same number of homeless people and the same number of a lack of affordable housing that we had before. Because this doesn't attempt to address it. The sponsors talk about it as an affordable housing bill, but it provides no affordable housing. And the changes have made it even less of an affordable housing bill. Um, this is really just Scott Weiner's personal vision, and this will be us implementing his personal vision. Once we implement it, we won't be able to go back. He has said, I believe single family housing is immoral. Yep. And he's gone on to talk about tree lined streets and tree lined backyards as if that's a bad thing. And what he wants is large stucco structures, lot line to lot line, removing all the trees, and then claiming that this is a climate victory. <laughs> the building and rebuilding of all this housing is a climate disaster. Yeah, yeah. The removal of all these trees. As we remove our tree canopy, we generate more of a heat island effect yeah. and we get hotter and hotter. And worldwide, we talk about the disaster of going to 2% increase in, in, uh, in degrees and what would happen. Well, LA itself has already experienced that. We're already at the, t the two degrees. Yeah. So this will just make it worse. Um, the, uh, his vision is to destroy every single family and neighborhood in the state, and his amendments make it even more likely. The new fourplex to sevenplex, we're not sure exactly where it lands, in every single family neighborhood in the state of California. This means that there will be no, his vision, it's not even to come up with the number of units, it's to do it his own destructive way. And so, it doesn't really solve any of the problems we're looking at, it just makes it worse. It gives us a couple extra years to implement this disaster, but it's so what? Um, he weakens the protection in higher, high fire severity zone areas, where we're trying not to allow a lot of multifamily building now in the hillsides, where we're likely to have some major fires. Why set us up for more of a disaster? These, these areas all have very narrow streets, when we do have a fire, and I've experienced that a couple times in my district, which goes right up to Sepulveda, and we've had two large fires on both sides. Um, those are narrow streets. You add a lot of density, it's a recipe for a disaster. But that's what this would do. Um, the problems that create homelessness, one of the biggest ones is purely at the state level. Um, I've been trying to fight it for over 25 years which is legislation uh, called Costa-Hawkins. I don't know how familiar you are with it. Um, years ago, I helped to found the city of West Hollywood, and I was on the council, and we created a strong rent control there. It was somewhat in response to what we were doing, which without a doubt, other cities like Los Angeles would be doing now otherwise, which was, we controlled not only the unit for the tenant, but we kept the unit affordable. So. The idea was in cities like West Hollywood that has strong rent control, if you left a $1,000 unit, the next person would rent a $1,000 unit. 
West Hollywood actually had a little quirk where we allowed a little bit of an increase on vacancy as long as that money was used to renovate the actual building. But either way, it meant that you kept the, the affordability. Now, if uh, senior citizens live in the building for 35 years and they're paying $1,000 for their rent, the next person is going to pay three or $4,000 because that's what the market is. So it guarantees that RSOs become luxury housing. You cannot go and find an RSO that is affordable because as soon as it becomes vacant, the values go way, way, way up. So that has to finally be changed. There's still not a whole lot of discussion about eliminating that legislation. And that absolutely has to be the first step. Um, I'm also looking at something, by the way, my, my first HHH housing project when it moves forward is expected to cost in the 300,000 per unit rather than the 700,000 range, which it is taking now. Um, we're using city property, which helps because I'm in the most expensive area in the city. Uh, otherwise, we'd be way overpaying. And we are using partially prefab uh, uh, units, so um, we'll be doing it in a, in a more efficient way. We expect it to be the best designed and best built building of all of them and at, at a much lower price. So hopefully that'll be an example. Um, we are causing some problems ourselves with uh, TOC and transit-oriented housing. Um, that happened because we passed Measure JJJ and hidden in that was legislation that said the planning director will make decisions and the city council has nothing to say about it. Um, and so as a result, uh, we are seeing people in affordable housing that can't afford more than their $1,000 or $1,100 a month rent uh, forced out by these projects and they are replaced by luxury housing. And even in my district, which has a lot of wealth, but not the people who live in apartment units, which are many, um, there are people that wind up going from being nicely housed to being housed in tents on the street. Um, and you see it in my district just like you see it everywhere else. Um, that does need to be changed. Um, I have to figure out how to change that. But uh, this is not a positive. The more luxury housing we built um, near transit, the less transit use we're having. <laughs> what a surprise, we're building more units near transit, we're getting less use. It's because the people that can afford luxury units tend to assist on drive, driving their cars. Thank you. The people that, people that are lower income, may not even have a car, may not be able to afford the gas, they'll you take the train, they'll take the bus. So intuitively, doing this more and more will mean less and less use as we've, we've found thus far. Uh, so in general, the angle of this, the excuses for passage, are all just excuses. They actually do more harm than good. And as I found anecdotally in my immediate neighborhood, where we have a number of historic buildings, um, and I should tell you, in my district, I tend to do hand-to-hand -hand combat around this. You find what looks like a historic building, we have a few people that are good researchers. Um, we try to uh, ask for historic preservation, and we preserve some units. Or in some cases, we've just stalled long enough that uh, uh, the developer doesn't buy the property to make his project larger, um, and, uh, and we maintain those historic properties. Um, but this is, this is already dramatically impacting the city. This will impact so much more. So near transit, near good jobs, you'll have intact single-family neighborhoods, and suddenly on one property, one you'll see a narrow 55-foot building. Um, and with some bonuses, uh, uh, the, the results are debated, but it appears they could go up to 85 feet. So you'll have a bunch of little houses, and then you'll have a tall, narrow 85-foot building. And because no you don't have to do any affordable housing until you get to 10 units, I'm predicting you will see a lot of large, luxurious nine-unit buildings. And then you'll see a lot more large, luxurious 19-unit buildings. And instead of merging three properties together for a complex, you'll do it on three successive lots 
Um, so you want to provide affordable housing. So what we're going to be doing is eliminating affordable housing that exists and replacing it with luxury housing. So there really is no effort to do the right thing. It's an effort to claim affordable housing on the trickle-down theory that you might remember from Reaganomics and oh, yeah. taxes. Yeah. If you tax the rich at a much lower rate, naturally they'll pass it on to their employees. <laughs> and, uh, Donald Trump has done the same thing. And we've seen the economy is great. It's really helped a lot of low-income people. We see them on the street every day and see how well they've been helped. And what we don't see is, is the thousands and thousands of people that are one medical bill or one layoff away from joining them. Um, so we, we have a, a long way to go. There's a lot we need to do, but this bill is anything but. It's just a gift to developers. It's a way for Scott Weiner to develop a great constituency behind himself for when he runs for statewide office at some point. He'll have all the developers behind him. By the way, I'll just mention two seconds of passing since I have the microphone. He won't be able to grab it from me fast enough. Um, Scott Weiner also has SP50, which would allow bars to stay open until 4 a.m. No, SP. Um, you said SP50. SP58. SP58. Uh, that would, uh, SP 58. SP 58. Uh, that would uh, allow bars in Los Angeles and West Hollywood, among other cities, Long Beach, to stay open until 4 a.m. Uh, the expected cost could be as much as $250 million a year to the city of Los Angeles. And so the question is, do we want to spend that $250 million on the homeless crisis or the not enough drinking between two and four crisis? <laughs> I hope we have our priorities straight. Uh, last year, just so you know, um, since we had a couple of state senators here, when this bill came before the state senate, the Los Angeles delegation had no, no votes on this. Um, we organized and I helped lead the effort and we killed it in the state assembly after it passed the state senate with virtually no opposition. Um, but so he will not only have developers, he'll have bar owners, he'll have nightclub owners, uh, he'll have restaurant owners, so I assume he's gonna run for something with all that. Um, but this is just a bad bill. It, it uh, has created all kinds of potential problems. Uh, I think the narrative of, well, what else will we do, I think has to be replaced by how do we build the number of homeless units? How do we build the number of low and moderate income yeah. units that yeah. we, we need? How can we change zoning so we dramatically incentivize developers to build the kind of housing that we need? Uh, I think that's the question not whether we should pass this bill in any incarnation because the, the basic goals behind it are nothing that we want to see. Contact uh, the leader of the state senate, Tony Atkins. Contact your local state senators and uh, ask them to vote no on this bill because it doesn't create any affordable housing. My name is Margaret Galen from the Park Bray Residents Association. Uh, two things, you say that because you know there is outstanding pending litigation on the legality of the transit-oriented communities. So, to the extent that they're in place and planning is going along with them, why is anything but affordable housing entitled to density bonuses? For example, a hotel in La Brea. Why, why is that even, why does the council even allow that? And number two, if it all comes down to a hidden reference to Mr. Bertoni or whomever it is, it doesn't he work for you? Can't the council find another job for him? <laughs> I'm serious, it's not a joke. And put somebody in who's actually looking out for the welfare of the community. Well, technically, in terms of who's gonna hire and fire him based on charter changes that were made, uh, uh, it seems like yesterday, but 15 or 20 years ago. Um, the mayor hires and fires all the department heads. So technically he works for the mayor. I think the mayor is much more open to the concepts behind SB 50 and transit-oriented communities Naturally. and all that. So uh, the council uh, doesn't have a lot of say over it. I have had meetings with him. I've tried to convince him to change. I continue to do that. Um, at some point we may need to uh, 
uh, put a son of JJJ on the ballot that takes back some of that, uh, that incentivizing. Um, the other thing is with, with some of the incentives, etc. those are state set. So a lot of the development that you see that you might not want to have and I might not want to have um, are by right. So they don't even come to the council, they're approved over the counter, they get extra incentives like uh, getting to put half a parking space when they really need a whole space. Now I've gotten a lot of developers to work with me in my district and I say look, do you want to work with me? You want, you want me to be helpful to you, etc. in the future? So let's see what we can agree on. How about putting back all the parking that the planning department encouraged you not to put in? Um, so I, I've gotten most of that parking in most projects so that uh, what might work, might, might, might work 25 years from now when nobody uses cars. In reality, that kind of cut just means that people will be driving around trying to find spaces right now. So, uh, so I've tried to work with developers to get them to not take advantage of all the incentives to the extent that I can create a good working relationship with them. What can we do maybe on a local level to take speculation out of real estate? I mean, here's the thing, if housing is a human right, then it shouldn't be the subject of speculation. And on the one hand, the governor is talking about we should have generic drugs because the market has not solved health care, the market hasn't created affordability in pharma. Not sure why he thinks it will in housing, but what can we do locally to ensure that speculation, which I believe is largely responsible for some of the price increases and lack of affordability, that's one, and what can we also do to address on a statewide level the jobs housing imbalance that is also largely behind uh, housing and affordability? It's difficult because a lot of the regulations uh, that we could use to reduce speculation, again, are uh, either at the state level um, or they're past part of the JJJ legislation that we're sort of hamstrung by. So uh, I, I try to do what I can, both on state legislation and uh, I'm trying to see what we can do to change uh, the results of JJJ. Um, but it's difficult. Um, just on a a development by development basis, trying to get jobs near housing. Um, in Century City, as an example, I approved a, a, a building, uh, 20 odd stories of housing. Um, it is luxury housing, but there are luxury jobs in uh, the towers of Century City. So we have people able to walk to and from their jobs. Um, and we didn't jam it down their throats. We worked with all the neighborhood groups that sometimes oppose projects and the developer worked with them and got concessions and reconfigured the, the project and uh, it worked and it went through with, without any significant opposition. So it can be done, um, but it's, we're, we're in a difficult situation with city legislation that we're locked into by the ballot and state legislation that has really caused a lot of harm and more of it's being debated now. I live in an older neighborhood with tiny lots uh, with a bunch of bungalows on whose 40-foot frontage. Is there any minimum lot size to which the SB 50 regulations would, would uh, uh, acquire? I, I don't believe so. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but you will see some very tall, skinny buildings <laughs> that really look Bizarre. This is a bizarre land use uh, iteration. So you'll see you'll see neighborhoods with with all small single family homes, and then you'll see these towers sticking up in a way no sane person ever would have zoned for them anywhere in the world. It'll almost look like a Martian landscape. Um, but but that's what we're being, what's being talked about. This is something that has a serious chance of passage. And so I think you really need to get your friends and neighbors to lobby everybody, lobby Tony Atkins, lobby all of the state senators around. And then once you see, if you see it passes, um, then we need to double our efforts to lobby uh, all the assembly people. Um, I wouldn't count on the governor's veto because I believe he is in favor of this legislation. I don't know that he has actually publicly come out yes but he is actually lobbying legislators to support it. 
So uh, we, we have to do it in the, in the Senate, if not in the State Assembly. Again, thank you so much, and let's all wait for the State Assembly. Why do you oppose SB 50? Well, because as Zev Yaroslavsky correctly said, it is not a housing bill, it's a real estate bill. And in fact, it's a bill that could have been written by the Trump administration. Uh, ben Carson has made statements blaming single-family housing for the lack of affordability. Remember, we have a developer president who made a fortune off of getting free air rights. You know, Scott Wiener calls this more homes. It has nothing to do with this. It should be the more real estate speculation and free air rights bill. And uh, it is all that bad, unfortunately. Now, uh, how do you think affordable housing should be provided? I think affordable housing should be provided by the government. It should subsidize 100% affordable housing for mainly nonprofits. And the governor vetoed a bill called SB5 that would have provided $2 billion a year for affordable housing. That may not be enough, but it's certainly a start. And the fact that the state, which is scapegoating cities, falsely, I believe, uh, eliminated redevelopment, that cost $12 billion for, in funding for affordable housing. So I think, I think we look at a model that is like Vienna and is like uh, Europe and Sweden and other countries, and it should be high quality. It shouldn't be, be crappy quality. It should be high quality housing that people would be happy to have in their communities. And we actually see there are places where you get 100% affordable housing, where this myth of NIMBYism is just false, where the neighbors have said, we welcome our new neighbors. I, don't, I think people have a sense of fairness, and they don't like it when people profiteer off of a, a, a situation like this.